she's here. Hey, Juliet. It's so good to see your faces. Oh, my God. Yeah, you too. Thanks for chatting with us. I'm excited. This is, I can honestly say this is a highlight for me. Of this oh, week. goodness. Well, it hasn't even happened yet. Here they come. Hello. Thank you all for joining us. Really nice to see you all. We've got the lovely Moss. Hey, Brownberry, designer, crafter, hey. podcaster extraordinaire with us all today. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Yeah. We're in John and Juliet's house. Which is quite nice. Without further ado, yes. yeah, let's turn to, you know, the whole reason we've all come to. <laughs> I'm excited about this. Yeah. So I, I am too. When we were first messaging, um, you said that you wanted to kind of talk about being as it's December and everyone's sort of thinking of the coming year and you wanted to sort of talk about like seasonality in your making and a bit of reflecting. And Yes, definitely. And first, I want to say thank you so much for having me as part of these conversations. I think you all do an excellent job of building community and the fact that you're able to do it globally. I'm in South Florida and you're in the UK and there's people from all over. I think it is incredible. So thanks for that. I always like to start with gratitude. So I get more of the things that I love by being grateful for them. (laughs) Um, And yeah, we talked about what would be um, interesting to me to share and to hear, um, hear thoughts from others on and and seasons in my making is what came to my mind first thing as you know Sonia I I tend to just jump into things so I consider myself um, a, a multifaceted maker there's a lot of fiber craft that I'm interested in but I'm often finding out that that fiber love informs life in general And so the seasons in my making are not just related to types of items that I'm knitting because it's a particular month in the year. It extends out into things like the projects that I choose and why, and the people that I collaborate with because of where I've reached, for example, in my design journey. And so I thought it would be really interesting to just talk about the way we move through this fiber life that we have. And um, it, it's, a, it's a constant reflection for me. So personally, like in my own yarn love world, December is a time of year when I tend to do things like dump all of my yarn out onto the floor in my craft room and take a look at what I have and think about what I want to keep or rehome for the coming year. Um, December is about the time in Florida weather-wise where working with heavier wools is something that I welcome in my space because it's finally dropped a few degrees and uh, that's a comfort. Um, It's a time that I reflect on what I've done for the year. So from a project perspective or um, partnerships and other things I've been part of. And I try to take that reflection into what what worked well for me, what lit me up, you know, what kind of fueled my creative passion. And from that list, what do I want to keep for next year or what would I like to change? Um, So, yeah, it's just a general time of reflection, end of the year that rolls right into the beginning of another. I think it's a a natural thing. Mm. And then if I take that reflection a bit like one step higher, just, I spend time thinking about, and I'm, I'm going to just point out my friend, Jenny, who's here and has to listen to a lot of these reflections every day. <laughs> yes, please. I think, I think about the larger scale reflection of where I am in my making journey in general. And that tends to have me thinking about what do I want to learn or what have I learned this year that I want to spend more time studying and practicing Um, And that reflection has been ongoing since I started knitting and crocheting in 2005, right? So that's a very long-term kind of look back and look ahead. 
Okay. And what kind of form do you, does it tend to take? Do you like write notes or yeah. do you tend to kind of get it down? I know you have a podcast, so is it more like of an audio thing for you or? Yeah, it's, it varies like everything with me. Um, I feel like I have a short attention span for any one thing, but the way that I do that reflection varies. I have a podcast on YouTube. It's the Hey Brown Berry Knitting Podcast. That is a really powerful visual journal for me. Um, it's a way for me to chronicle projects. And uh, when we used to go to the outside, you know, to mark my travel and um, talk to other people about their making. So that's an easy way for me to see what I was doing at any given time in a year and what I was interested enough in to take a video of it and talk about it. So that's definitely one of them. I'm on Instagram as Hey Brownberry as well. And Instagram, uh, I, I joined Instagram because of the photos and I stayed for the people. Yeah. I say that all the time. <laughs> so uh, Instagram is another kind of visual method to chronicle um, what I want to share. I, I tend to use my Instagram account as a connection point. It's called Hey Brownberry because I think of conversation all the time. I'm very interested in sharing what I think about something or feel about something and then hearing back from others. It's just something that lights me up. So it's called Hey Brownberry because I, I wanted every comment to start like someone was calling me into conversation. <laughs> like, hey, Brownberry, this is what I think of this picture you posted or um, here's my answer to the question you posed. So that's another method. And I tend to go back to my own posts because sometimes I talk to myself in those posts. You know, you know, this is how I was feeling on a given day or here's what I'm feeling grateful for. Or, here's what has me feeling anxious. And I can go back to my own posts and kind of listen to myself or remind myself of things from a moment in time. Um, I do like to write, physically write, you know, pen and paper and journal, whether it's making lists or um, what I call random journaling, which is if I'm having a moment of agitation or anxiety, sometimes what I'll do to alleviate that is just start like a stream of consciousness writing on any piece of paper that's near me and just naming the feelings that I'm having and working through it. Um, yeah. And I guess my projects are another form of of reflection and, um, and chronicling, you know, the, the projects that I'm making kind of show me where I am with my skill level and my interest level or um, what new yarns I've discovered, for example. So yeah, it takes, it takes on multiple forms for sure. Your Instagram is beautiful. There are so many wonderful photos there and it's so joyful. It's so Thank you. I, I, I love it. Yeah. It is I really appreciate cool. that. Thanks. It's, it's really think. alive. Yeah. yeah. It's really vibrant <laughs> in a very Thank real you. way. Well, yeah. it's delightful. Yeah. I appreciate that. I know that it's not easy for everyone to participate in social media the same way. So I, I take that compliment very gratefully. And, um, I have to say that I work at it not being too curated on purpose because kind of a, a curated view for me is not as accessible. Mm. And because connection is what I'm after, um, it's easier for me, to be honest, to share something that's not too scripted, not too curated, because then it can be whatever I want it to be. Yeah. You know, whatever I need it to be on a given day, I can share what I want and, and, I wouldn't expect anybody to say, well, that's really not like Mars because there isn't such a thing. <laughs> I think if you feel that it's joyful and that's the overall sense you get from it, that's wonderful. I'm glad of that. I have a lot of things to feel joyful about, but I also, I think it's really important for people to know that not every day is the same. Not every day is great right? It's true, definitely. <laughs> I mean, hearing you talk has already made me feel that, like, all I do usually is, like, 
rush around and I'm always focusing like two or three steps down the line I feel like you'll probably have a very similar personality no. to me in that respect and it's like actually I probably I don't really other than like when I'm sitting in bed at night and like knitting yeah. and listening to an audiobook or something just before I go to sleep but I don't really give myself much time to reflect no. do you mm. not as much as I should yeah. the allotment is John's space mm. that's another that makes space. sense it's, yeah sometimes yeah. that's what it is it's a space or <laughs> a reason or a time of day that allows that I'll say yeah. Yeah, Sonia, we do have that in common. And um, one of the things that I've learned about myself in, in many years of being on this planet is I have to allow for seasons of change mm -hmm. because I can get in my head, like many people, I can get in my head about some persona that I've created, some, some thing that I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm a maker and therefore I should do this or be interested in that or whatever. And, and if I box myself in that way, um, that is an uncomfortable place for me. So talking about someone who rushes around and, and is scattered, I am that person. Some of you have watched my podcast and you will say, that's not true. She's so calm and it's so quiet there. And I'm just going to tell you the truth. That is still me, but it is a space and a moment based yeah. way of being. <laughs> so this might not be the case for everybody, but when I turn the camera on or when I'm in a space with a person I trust, I calm down and I get quiet and I'm able to reflect. Mm. And a lot of the times I'm gifting that to myself because I've been very scattered and I know the things that bring me calm. I know the people that bring me back to center. So I go to that because I need that balance. Mm. Um, but it's not my natural state of being. <laughs> My, uh, my children and my husband will will vouch for that. <laughs> my cat brings me calm because mm. she will sit and not let me move, and then I indulge. Yeah, and that's I, excellent. She's perfect. I love that you have that. If it's something that you need, I I would want you to have that. Yeah, and uh, I think that whatever that thing is. I think whatever the activity is, if you can find something like that, where you're maybe your brain switches into a mode that's not um, instinctive to you, but it goes to a place that you like and that serves you, I say, find that thing. I would say my knitting is like that, but more so I found my spinning to be like that um, more recently. Spinning fiber is a um, meditative, a more calming experience in some cases when I hit that groove yeah you know on my spinning wheel I'm treadling I know exactly what to do with drafting that sweet spot is lovely it's good for my mind <laughs> so what what's the last fiber you've been spinning oh my gosh it's been a little while so um I had some I call it uh, farm fiber, like we say farm yarn from Rhinebeck mm. two years ago. Wow. And yeah, and I had it on a spindle and I was like loving the spindle spinning process of this fiber. My friend up in the Northeast US has many, many sheep. Um, her name is Amanda of Prado Delana Farm. And I had some fiber on a spindle and the last thing I spun was plying some of that up off the spindle um and now that we're talking about it I need to get back to it <laughs> <laughs> not just this moment though. <laughs> it's been too long I I can tell when things are really full when certain things fall off like mm -hmm. I get in a mode where spinning for example is all I want to do and then things come into the space stuff gets put on the plate and that thing falls off that's what I can tell yeah, Definitely. I have a hand spun project with some John Arbin fiber I wanted to share. Oh, <laughs> could we have a? Well, I may not. I may not say this right. Is it 
Galetta guitar. Yeah, Galetta guitar. Galetta guitar. Okay, so I have, this was one of my, I wanted to share it because it's no secret. I am a super fan of John Arvin Textiles. Let's just get that straight right now. John is going to have to come join us. Let's join just get that, let, let's put that out there. Let's just get 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 that out there. Hello, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> no, I'm good. It's so good, good. to see you. Yeah, and you. Oh, I've got the glasses on. Uh, now I can see. <laughs> it's me. It's me. Oh, it is you. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> it's no secret. I'm a super fan. Sonia can tell you. She's That's She'll mom. start a message to me like, hey, would you like? And I'm just like, yes, whatever it is. I don't care. Yes. Yep. Love to. <laughs> so I spun up some Galetta guitar and... Um, first of all, your colors, there's a lot of your color ranges that are just right in my wheelhouse. Um, I'm a fan of red, all shades of, of red. I'm a fan of jewel tones. So Galetta Guitars, burgundy fiber that I spun into these socks. Oh, that lovely. See if I can get. Wow. So I, I combine this. I'll hide my face so it'll show up a little better. And they're worn, by the way, people. Don't be ashamed to, sh to show your worn stuff. Can I just put out a public service in it? Like, how do you know I love these socks? I've worn them till they need to be mended. Like, the, I love them, okay? I love this fiber. This is my pattern, R&R &R socks. And the reason I'm so proud of this is because spinning fiber into hand-spun yarn for me is its own project. Right. So if I show someone fiber and they're like, oh, what are you going to make? And I'll tell them hand spun yarn. One step at a time. One step at a time. Finished, yeah. right? <laughs> Finished the, object, hand spun yarn. We, of um, course, you know, given the job we do, we know quite a lot of spinners. And actually, I think there's quite a lot of people out there who don't really want to knit so we know yes. quite a lot of spinners who like pair Two up that, with yeah. a knitter or a weaver or a crocheter and they just have this little partnership yeah. going on exactly and, and it's perfect because they are such different kind they of are. rhythm to them and completely different things so yeah. and why not get out of it what you want to get yeah. out of it and the part mm -hmm. that you love so I love that that sounds like a, a beautiful relationship yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I know if anyone yeah. be my spinning buddy. <laughs> take now taking applications. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I you know, so I spun it up. I loved the finished hand spun. And then I was talking with a friend of mine about how I might use it. And this is sometime after I had spun it. And I think we may have been either in October or in some period of let's knit all the socks and I thought this is the first time where I have spun yarn fine enough that I think I would use it in a nice um a nice dense fabric sock project so I picked my R&R &R socks pattern and I love this pattern because it has a heel I'm falling in love with which is putting the um reinforced heel flap on the bottom of the sock because that's where I tend to wear my socks out I've never seen that before, but that's really sensible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's fun. I, it, it's not difficult to do. And I have a couple of patterns now that feature that because I, I want to make projects for use. And so having a reinforced heel and toe is, is useful for a person like me who wears those areas out and who doesn't always have the patience to sit and mend. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I don't make time for it. So I just put in the reinforcement. And I mean, you can see a bit, um, it's getting blown out a bit here. You can see, I'm really proud of having spun fiber at that. It's amazing. At that weight. Yeah. And it was a treat from start to finish. Oh. It, so both of the finished projects, the yarn and the socks, <laughs> I was really happy with those. Um, yeah, you guys have lots of great options. I have a, I have a pile over here that I'm looking at of things I want to share. So I know that this is a conversation with Hey Brownberry, but you're just gonna have to deal with the fact that I'm gonna fangirl on your yarn and fiber. <laughs> 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 We're just gonna go with it. <laughs> um, yeah, so in talking about seasons of making and reflecting, 
I've been spinning for just, well, I started in 2017. I learned how to spin on a spindle at a festival. And things like spinning up a yarn with purpose for a project and then wanting to knit with that yarn and and make it into something. For me, that is a progress marker. And I can think about all the milestones along that journey and look back and still remember the Mars that would have told you, there's no way I can spin sock yarn. Like that's (laughs) not going to (laughs) happen. That sounds like something, you know, really talented spinners do. (laughs) So it's nice to have things like projects that you actually put on your feet and wear around to mark those milestones. Um, And that's different for everybody. You know, there were a lot of places along that road to, uh, to celebrate too. Yeah, definitely. So what some of your main reflections from Mm. um, like this last year? The first thing that comes to mind is, I've recent, recently started talking about normalizing slow making and long-term projects. Um, I have to strike this balance between being a person who really loves to share things. I love sharing on my Instagram and on my YouTube channel. And I, and I often get feedback that says people enjoy the fact that I share how excited I am about whatever new thing I'm into. Um, But there's a line at which that sharing can become a pressure to show what I have finished. And so recently I've been reflecting on how nice it is to be working on the same thing for a long time. And the fact that there is a comfort in something like a sweater or a blanket project, or even if it's not an object, even the comfort of I'm learning a new skill and it's going to take me time to get proficient in that thing. Uh, I want to be a person who feels more comfortable in that time in between the start and the sharing. (laughs) I also reflect on, I also have a desire to be a person who shares the fact that this thing takes a long time so that other people can feel comfortable doing that too. And that's what I mean when I say normalize it. If you take Instagram for an example, you may see that someone has, you know, picked a yarn for a project. Um, Like I picked this yarn, this Harvest Hughes, Rose Bay. Again, more John Arbin. Hopefully you guys can see. So uh, I picked this yarn, you know, more than a year ago. And I had a thought about a sweater more than a year ago. And I wanted to be brave enough to design a garment for a few years now. And if I think about this whole project, it's a very long-term project for me. And sometimes you'll go to Instagram, for example, and see that someone will show the yarn and then they show the sweater. And and there's this lost space in between. (laughs) So uh, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of, you know, be one of the champions for the longer term study or project or endeavor. Um, I'll show you guys the sweater that has come of this yarn after almost a couple years now. It's not quite done and it does need some rework in the pattern. And I'm also gonna normalize, show the fact that you don't weave in your ends until you're quite done. (laughs) Oh, it's beautiful. There we go, beautiful. Hopefully you can see, It's, it's quite simple. It's quite a simple pullover. With some little details like a, a split hem. Yeah. See, I'm showing that. And a little fancy bits on the sleeve. Oh, oh, beautiful. A little bit of cuff detail. And the rest of the detail is really just in the shaping and making something that I think um, can fit multiple bodies and shapes and sizes and so on. Um, but the point is, this has taken me a really long time in my in my opinion, it's a long time project. Um, and I actually tried it on and there are changes that I want to make. So it's going to take me even longer before I can get it to the point of sharing it with the knitting world. But I've just been reflecting on the fact that that's okay. And I'm starting to prefer thinking about all of my making as just a a lifelong journey. Can I share a secret with you which I know (laughs) because I work in the yarn industry and please tell people about their designs 
a lot of the time people take all of these pictures six months beforehand and then when they're actually ready to share about a project and when a pattern is coming out they then condense like six months to a year or however long right. it is into the space of two or three weeks because that is how long people's attention span is for like a proper marketing push that's it. so I think that really does when so many folks you follow on Instagram are like designers that yeah. really does kind of complicate things but yeah it totally does. people are not actually making these projects in the time they yeah. just take all the photos and save them up um, but I think it's a really good thing to talk about. It came up when we were chatting with Katie last month as mm -hmm. well, of just like, how is it that so many people are churning all these projects out? And I'm still like halfway down <laughs> my sock. Right, it right. It's time. You, know? you need the real perspective, I think, from at least some of us in the community, because mm -hmm. that's what's more accessible. And also I would hate for folks who are, who are just starting. Imagine how many people have launched into Fibercraft because they were on stay-at-home orders and wanted a new thing to do. And if their first presentation from our collective community is, you have to be really good at all of this right away and very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. not accessible. And then also there's value in a thing that took you a long time and a lot of effort, in my opinion. Mm. I, like anybody, am just a sucker for instant gratification for certain things. So I'm not going to pretend like even this comes naturally to me, but there's value in sinking into something. Um, and I was sharing with a friend the other day that I'm at the point in a sweater project that I'm making where coming back to it on the couch every day, that's my, that's my thing for the day that makes me feel really good and settled because I'm, I've hit that groove of like, this is what I'm knitting for the foreseeable <laughs> future. I'm comfortable with the pattern. This project invites me back in. Yeah. And that's really nice. I think that's just a, a fun thing. Um, and I guess my one other reflection I would share, I would love to take questions, is um, the, the thing that I almost missed, and I would have missed if I hadn't paid attention to it, is how much learning I still have left to do in the world of creating and making. Um, I started earlier this year taking online classes because that became, to me, it became so much more prevalent in our world where you could take classes from teachers in a Zoom scenario like this. And, you know, they were able to do demonstrations and other things that we used to only be accustomed to in a live class setting. And that accessibility of being able to join in on a class through my computer really sparked this reminder for me, like, hey, there's a lot of stuff I still don't know how to do, or there are things that I know how to do and I'd like to know how to do them better or try another method. And that availability was something that I decided I want to take on intentionally and start treating things like a study is what I call it. Um, that sweater came about as part of my sweater study. I want to understand sweater construction better because by the way, knitting a bunch of sweaters doesn't necessarily mean that I understand sweater construction and, and fit and shaping. It just means that I've followed a lot of patterns. And so to be intentional about my learning has been a gift this year. And I, that's one I'll definitely continue. Yeah. I republished uh, a pattern of mine it's called the ritual shawl and the quick design story behind the ritual shawl is that I cast it on strictly because I had a couple of yarns in my stash that I just had to get on the needles you ever have those projects where you're like I don't care I need to do something with this yarn um, but what I also wanted was a project that didn't take too much brain space and I wanted it to I wanted the knitting of it to feel like a ritual and for me, that's stockinette back and forth, just, just knitting and purling. And so this shawl is made up of a lot of that. And I published that pattern um, some years ago. And then, you know, didn't Faye just come up with a, a colorway for you guys? Another <laughs> Friday night, didn't she just put out this, this gorgeous color? 
it's like this rich midnight gray navy mashup awesomeness. <laughs> Good description. And that was again one of those yarns where I said, "Oh, I have to. I just have to get this cast on. <laughs> I need to work with this." So I revisited my ritual shawl and republished it in a heavier weight by carrying that yarn doubled and adding in some pollen gold devonia it's beautiful and if you look at it it's it's quite simple right it's it's mostly stockinette with some garter ridges but um my knitting teaches me a lot of life lessons and I don't mean to sound cliche it, it really does I learned by way of this pattern about doing an applied edging mm -hmm. and so I included that because it's just a little splash of something. And that's kind of how our, our life is. Mm -hmm. A lot of life is like this. You're just, you're going through your daily regular happenings and, you know, hopefully you get some blips of color and delight in there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all hopefully mostly what you expect and what you can manage. And then along the way, some good things pop in to remind you that, <laughs> I'm really glad I'm here and, and experiencing this. And then when you want to or need to, you can put as much of that color and beauty and, and, and detail into your experiences as, as you can stand, right? And I thought, this is one of those things that I hope someone will take with them to another project. Mm -hmm. I had the joy of working with your yarn and publishing my first shawl pattern and I revisited it because of the experience of that. Yeah. Um, and I made it in heavier weight because I like blanket size shawls. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a schlanket shawl person. <laughs> um, it's beautiful. Yeah, but simply, you know, doubling up the yarn strands and going at it again was like a whole new experience of its own. Oh, thank you for showing us. It's oh, it's good stuff. Beautiful. It's good. This is not difficult for me to work with this, trust me. <laughs> Navy and the pollen gold together yeah, is, lovely, lovely. is very good as well. Yeah. Lovely. Yep. I'm surrounded by talented artisans, I tell you what. <laughs> Nancy, in particular, um, was saying... Um, she's make she's taking Sue Matten's six month crochet course, oh. um, and there's something very comforting about um, like having a long term project, and no one expects it to be finished by next weekend. And I right. think that also that no one it's like often the no one is the person in your head. Yes, you know, because no one like, else actually it is cares yes. mostly, but. Um, and then we are so like, loud in our own heads, which would be yeah. fine if we were always cheerleading. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. Definitely. And then Good Beck, on you for that study. And then Bex also says that she's all about normalizing long-term projects and making alterations to almost finished projects. Yes. So <laughs> even if you finished it, and then you decide it's not actually quite right. I um, This is a big thing of mine, actually. Like this sweater I'm wearing, I actually made the sleeves twice because the first time it just wasn't right and it wasn't like sitting in there properly. And I just thought I've spent all that time knitting the body and I actually really right. want it as an item. And so it's better to just like undo 20 hours of work knitting a sleeve but then actually have a project you're gonna want to have in your wardrobe at the end of it like it's that's great. key that's yeah. key the motivation for each project isn't always the same but I feel like that's a good one will this be useful to me in some way when it's done um, sometimes that usefulness is just the experience and you can walk away from it yeah maybe without that item um, but yeah, I think that's a really good thing to anchor on. Mm. I think it looks like Jenny asked a question yeah, about what I have in the works. It. Oh man. So what I have in mind for upcoming study, um, a couple of things. So one is a bit broad. Um, 
as a knitwear designer, I feel like there are process things that I want to re-examine. So how I go about publishing patterns, um, what I choose to put out there in, in the world of design. I've learned a lot in the last couple of years about my own uh, natural way of doing things. <laughs> and what I've learned about that is I tend to take on, I want to take on all the pieces and there's something about, you know, creating my baby and doing every piece of the process. And I'm learning how to um, outsource and delegate and give some of those pieces over to other people. So I'm sort of studying that process while I'm trying to decide what changes need to be made because I'm finding a groove with my design of focusing on things like fit and even for simple projects like socks. I released a sock pattern um, nice. just recently, this sock pattern, um, which was based on encouraging people to use heavier weight yarns for socks, normalize not all sock yarn being fingering weight, <laughs> encouraging people to... Yeah, encouraging people to um, knit to fit. I think the light's better here. Oh, I love them. So knitting according to the fit of your foot in particular, including the toe, you know, shaping the toe to your toe shape, um, knitting around this instep area to fit you. These are pieces that I am studying in my own design work because what I want to do is find a way to make that a part of my design style. So teaching you about things like fit by way of a cute sock, um, teaching you about using different yarns and fibers in a project by way of a pattern that kind of gives you a thing that you can go try. Um, but to focus on that takes a part of my brain that's, that's thinking about, or that's, that's looking at how do I construct this item and how do I talk about it? So my study is, do I also want to be really good at the layout of the pattern and the images that I use? And do I have to be the person who's knitting it? <laughs> Maybe I'm doing the words and someone else has the needles. So it's a longer term look at my Hey Brownberry Designs knitwear business. And I have to treat it like a study because if I don't, I know that I'll disregard some details if I don't take that view of it, right? I'll just like throw more stuff on my plate more likely. Um, so it's, it's a business study. And then in my making, um, I haven't thought too much yet about different types of study. I wanna continue my sweater study to answer Jenny's question. I wanna continue my garment sizing and fit study. And, and within that, there's so much. There's actual techniques and methodologies, there's styles, there's what kinds of fabric you can create, there's understanding body proportions. So that one will probably continue from a making perspective. I don't think you ever stop learning that, do you? No, thank goodness. No, no, like, I always think it's... Thank goodness. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of giving up on life or no, being interested. Like, surely, yeah, to be interested yeah. in something is to want yeah. to learn about it. And if you're not... Yeah, and at whatever it, level, I would not pretend that I'm trying to go for some mastery level or, you know, I want proficiency and I want to feel like I know enough to always feel like I have options. Mm. Or I could take another approach. That's probably my marker um, of, a, of learning. Do you find that you are drawn to it at like particular times of the year? I know you garden yeah. as well. So are you always dying with things from your own garden that you've grown? Could you kind of talk a little bit about um, sure. sort of all of that? That's very sweet of you to say I garden. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I like, do a bit of, you know, gardening. Gardening. <laughs> I, I I put seeds in the ground and I cross my fingers. <laughs> um, I appreciate that that question because um, I have thought about what it is that draws me to natural dyeing, and the thing I come up with is natural dyeing yarn and fabric for me has a beautiful. Uh, it allows this beautiful cycle of being able to use a thing up. 
So for example, dyeing with food waste, like pomegranate skins or onion skins, um, it feels like, oh, I've gotten such great use out of this, this food item. I love the taste of it. And now I can use this other part of it to make color on this other material that I really love. And when it's done in the dye pot, I can put it out in the garden as compost. And it's just this gorgeous cycle of like, I used every bit of this that I know how to use. And I got this really colorful, pretty thing. Um, and I can feel good about all of the material. So what draws me to it usually is honestly that I have you know stuff in my pantry piled up to a point <laughs> where I'm like, <laughs> This bag of onion skins is overflowing. I could probably make some beautiful color with that. Um, and, and I also find, to, to be a bit more serious about it, I also find that dyeing itself is a, a process that you have to slow down a bit if you want to do it well, or if you want to be a little bit precise about the outcome it does take a lot of time prepping the yarn so that it can take on natural dye colors is a step, you know, um, working with things like heat for certain plant materials. There's a, there's a variation in the outcome based on how long you let something simmer and soak and all of that. And those multi-step processes, again, don't come natural to scattered short attention span Mars, but because I know I love the outcome, I tend to move towards natural dyeing when I know I need a slowdown. And because I know the outcome will motivate me, I'll take those steps and I'll take my time. Um, I've done acid dyeing in the past and you get beautiful outcomes with acid dyeing and you get really rich colors, um, but it's more immediate in most cases. You literally can sprinkle some acid dye powder on something and, and there you go, you know, you've got rich color. Uh, so that's a different experience. So I'm typically called into it when I need a bit of a slowdown. Mm -hmm. So Natalie has asked, of all your designs, which is your favorite? Oh my goodness. That is my, a big question. And I have an answer for that, actually. <laughs> it's the first thing that came to my mind when you said that, because I have not been asked that question before. So thank you. It's my first one. My first design is my favorite because that was the moment of stepping out into a public view yeah. of my own, my own creation. So yeah, my first one. And then I would probably say as a secondary, the one I published most recently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whichever is the latest one. <laughs> so um, I fell in love with fiber crafts while living in Florida. I've been in Florida since 1993. I was born in, on the island of Jamaica. I was raised in central Canada. You would think that Canada would have been a great motivator to fall in love with wool. Not so much. <laughs> uh, I fell in love with making with yarn um, while I was here in Florida and I actually started with crochet. So technically I started with cotton, which I think was pretty common back then to do crochet projects in cotton, acrylic and so on. Didn't know about wool right away. Um, further on into the process of discovering fibers, I found some 100% wool. I think it must have been like Patton's Classic or something at a big box store. And it was amazing to me that you could get animal fiber in, in this place that I was used to getting cotton and acrylic. Um, and when I tried it out and worked with it, something about the properties of the fiber just immediately spoke to me. It was probably something simple. I don't know if this was the moment, but it was probably something simple like, you know, making a project with wool and then soaking it in water and being able to stretch it and it kept its shape. And, and I was like, what is this magic? <laughs> this is, this is not a deep study in this property of this fiber, but something like that, where I was like, this is a very unique thing. And I have to tell you that my connection to it is very tactile. I prefer the way that warmer fibers feel in my hands to work with. Um, and I love all of the almost hidden properties. You know, wool is antibacterial and it modulates temperature and it does all these great things. And immediately as I met people who were into it, I had some kind of connection with people who were into it. So I feel like, you know, woolly people are also people who believe in place-based things. They believe in care for 
the animals that produce the fiber and the land that they live on and all this other stuff that I'm also interested in. So I have to give some credit to that for the connection as well. Making woolly things while living in Florida may not seem practical, but I'm thankful that my work has always had me travel. So at least a few times of the year, I could then use these things. I remember outfitting my family in a whole set of scarves and hats and mittens one year because we were taking this one trip to the Northeast US and I was like, and knits for everybody. <laughs> We've got one chance to wear these. Um, so the, the practicality of it comes about because of my travel, not because of where I actually live. <laughs> That's fantastic. Amazing. You probably haven't seen what what you've just said has really reminded me of your knitted pantaloons, which I should have shown you a photo at the time. Do you have those to, 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 hand, to hand. hand? Juliet is a, is a pantaloon fan. Anyway, I, wear a lot. I know where they are. I'd have to step away and go to them. I knitted, I did, I knitted myself leggings. They like were a cuckoo beautiful. person. <laughs> that like broke Instagram <laughs> like, <laughs> for about a day and a half. The picture you're talking about from Instagram is literally me holding up my dress, showing knit pants. <laughs> That's it's amazing. Like, please picture me on a random sidewalk in Norway as a person with a camera on a tripod, on a tripod, and her dress lifted up to show an item. Just be that person walking by on the sidewalk that day. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for chatting. I know we're coming to the end. Oh, I'm going to say, you've got to tell us about your retreat. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Juliet, for reminding me. Yes. Um, So I am one half of the planning team and coordinating team for the CAN retreat. Um, myself and Anne Choi are running the Creative Advocacy and Networking Retreat. And this retreat is uh, centered on amplifying underrepresented voices in the fiber community. So we have run it once before and it's coming up again in January. And our target audience is really black, indigenous and people of color in the fiber industry and fabric as well, sewists, who really would like some mentorship and some support in whatever version of their fiber life they're trying to grow. So some of them are designers, some are dyers, um, some would like to be published uh, in, in writing about their craft. And so they're coming at this um, fiber community from different angles, but like any of us, they need a hand with some of these things. So thank you for the support of allowing me to talk about it. The topic itself is one that is uh, very dear to me. It's something that, of course, I have lived experience being in a, a marginalized group, but the idea that we can focus on how those of us who've reached any point in a journey can still help others reach their own next milestone. That's something that's really near and dear to my heart. We are going to Wonder World next April, and I think you'll be there as well, (laughs) maybe. We're so excited. So um, I got to tell you, I have some of the best, fiber friends and I'm told I've been I've been given assurances that I must be at this event and I'm going to get to spend time with some of my absolute favorite people and I cannot wait to see you all Uh, if any of you who are on here will be there please come find me oh it's such a wonderful show it's a wonderful show and it's going to be our first show for ages back in the real world it's a great Uh, that's that's a special honor (laughs) i will try not to hog all your time with hugs and whatnot so you can actually sell some yarn (laughs) we'll have to go get dinner or something we'll be making you sniff all the fiber (laughs) as i like to say don't threaten me with a good time Excellent. I can't wait. I can't wait. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody who took your time out to spend it with me and Juliet and Sonia. I'm I'm so grateful. I appreciate this connection very much. It's Thank been you. delightful. It's been it absolutely has. wonderful. It and it's so special to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll see you around the interwebs. <laughs>
Look, all the hearts, everybody's Oh, yeah, look. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you, thank you. That's so great. Thank you, thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us. My pleasure. Yeah. Have Have a a great weekend, everybody. And you. You take care. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.